Lovely. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming along to hear about product stewardship. I'm sure you're going to see a lot of overlapping themes between all of our presentations, so you'll all be experts by the end of this. Um, I've been involved in this space for longer than I care to think about, really, um, starting with plastics back in the 1990s. Um, well, not late 1980s, but... Um, so today I'm just going to talk a little bit about product stewardship in practice, a little bit of product stewardship 101, because not all of you will have been closely involved in this, and talk about the way it is a new model and how we need to keep um, developing it. And I should just mention briefly, Brooke Donnelly um, from the Packaging Covenant and I have been working on a product stewardship network, um, the development of a new network. So um, we've been running workshops, including one just before this. So if any of you are interested in, in knowing about that, um, come and see me or Brooke. So just briefly, yeah, what it is, um, how it's different to the traditional model, how it can help both um, industry and local government and talk about some case studies and collaboration. Well, that's interesting. The quote of the day was from our workshop yesterday on the product stewardship um, cluster, which was uh, collaboration is the bleedingly obvious. Of course we want to collaborate. It's working out how we can do it better, both within this sector and with, with people like yourselves. Carmel's already brought up the definition. Um, this is you know, more or less from the um, Product Stewardship Act. I just wanted to remind everyone that it, it's not just about environmental impacts. We are talking about um, environmental and other, so all sorts of impacts in the supply chain and at end of life, whether they're to do with human rights or communities or um, other social issues as well. Um, the challenge with this term is it has become a little bit of a buzzword, a bit like sustainability and now circular economy. Um, it does mean different things to different people. Um, and certainly business people prefer to talk about things like material efficiency uh, or um, life cycle management, those sort of terms. So we have to be careful not to use too much jargon. The other term that's commonly used is extended producer responsibility, EPR, particularly in Europe. Um, I prefer the broader um, idea of product stewardship EPR tends to be more focused on end of life and tends to be regulated, whereas in Australia we have had success with voluntary and, and co-regulatory schemes. So just a little bit about the 101, it obviously is about the life cycle. We tend to focus on the end of life in these discussions, but many of us that are in this area want to keep pushing the focus back up to the design and um, sort of more eco-design, supply chain management and so on, because that's where a lot of the interventions are required. And it really does depend on what problem we're trying to solve. If we're trying to solve issues in the supply chain, um, deforestation, uh, human rights, uh, whatever, it might be more about procurement standards. There's a new sustainable procurement standard that's just been released. If it's a product is not recyclable because of the way it's been designed or it's got too much packaging, then the solution is at the design stage. And we need to keep this focus on um, the whole of life. Of course, if something doesn't have a, a solution at end of life, that's where these product stewardship organisations are playing a critical role. It may or may not be regulated. Clearly in Europe and parts of North America and Asia, there's more of a focus on regulation, and at times that is absolutely essential, and uh, like Carmel, I'd love to see more of it. Minimises free riders, expectations are clear, gives the community confidence through you know, targets and public reporting and so on. On the other hand, voluntary um, schemes offer greater flexibility for um, industry and for adapting over time as products change, for example, um, and there can be lower admin costs, not necessarily, but there can be. So I think in Australia we've got a range of models um, that have been successful and we need to keep an open mind about what, what works and what doesn't work. But because by its nature product stewardship involves things that aren't, are outside the direct control of the, the brand owner or the retailer, Collaboration is essential. Each actor, including um, many local government people who are in the room, we've all got a role to play. Um, it can be product stewardship also encompasses individual actions that companies take. You know, Aldi and IKEA, for example, are taking back all sorts of products, including batteries. A lot of furniture companies are taking back their products. Um, but where it makes sense, where it's more effective or efficient, companies are coming together to do this together, and we're seeing lots of great examples. One of the interesting things about this is that it does represent a new model for waste management. If you go back in time, local government has always had you know, statutory responsibility for waste management. It was about putting it into landfill or burning waste. Obviously, this has evolved over time to include curbside collection, drop-off facilities and other um, 
services um, that do recover more materials. Interestingly, you know, in the early days of uh, curbside recycling, it was the companies that stepped up to do that because there were, wasn't a service. It was the beverage companies, the publishers, and others that provided the woven polypropylene bag, if any of you remember that, that evolved into crates and so on. But of course, this is now a standard feature of local government services. What we're seeing now is more of a shared responsibility model. There's been a lot of pressure from local and state government over the years to get companies to step up and share the cost of, of recycling. And in many areas, we are seeing that happen. Of course, in other areas, we're not just yet. Um, so this is really moving, um, local government clearly is going to continue to have the lead role in a lot of this, um, but we're seeing more um, collaboration between industry and councils. So yeah, from local government to shared responsibility, um, one of the features of the product stewardship model is it generally is about shared responsibility. Clearly the manufacturers have a, have a very important role to play, but it's shared. From a focus of, on end of life uh, through to what can happen at whole of life to make the recovery uh, end uh, more efficient. And a focus on um, recyclable markets and, and end markets through to let's think a little bit more strategically and in a more sophisticated way about wh what we can do in terms of durability, extending life, reuse, remanufacture and so on. Um, so I thought I'd just briefly mention one of the case studies from back then. People think that PET is a wonderful recyclable material, and of course it is, but it wasn't originally. When the, the single-use bottles were introduced, there was a huge backlash from government in particular, um, from some of the big beverage companies who were saying, well, why would I replace a recyclable glass bottle with a non-recyclable plastic bottle? Um, there was huge pressure. And so the company, if they wanted to get into this market, had to establish an end-of-life solution. Um, some of you may remember that PET bottles used to have a really heavy HDPE base at the bottom. One of the first things companies did was get rid of that, redesign the bottle to the rocket shape so that it was mostly PET. The industry brought in the um, plastics identification code, which has been a mixed success. Um, ACI Pedalite set up a recycling facility the industry underwrote the, the price of um, plastics. Um, and as an industry, I was working for the plastics industry at the time, we were running a lot of trials with um, councils because at the time, plastic bottles weren't collected at curbside. So this is the sort of process um, that we need to see replicated, not necessarily at curbside, but a collaboration between the manufacturer, the, end, the, the customers, councils, and of course, consumers. Why is product stewardship so important? And I, I guess a little bit about why it's different to EPR. It does address the complexity of sustainability. If you look at any product or material, it has multiple impacts. It is complex. You can't just say, we're going to regulate to ban this or do that, although sometimes that may be needed. It is complex. Um, it, it requires a sort of a multifaceted response, obviously. Um, it looks at the whole life cycle and it leverages the influence and resources of multiple stakeholders. I thought I'd just mention PVC because the PVC stewardship program is a little bit unusual in that it does look at the full life cycle and they responded to a lot of stakeholder pressure across multiple issues, whether it was dioxins in the manufacturing process, incineration and the you know, release of dioxins, lack of recyclability, um, air emissions in, in offices, there was a whole lot of complex issues. They put together a, a supply chain collaboration um, and developed a program. One of the things I like about it is that it is a life cycle approach. It's not just about recycling. They have various ways that they consult with uh, stakeholders to keep their program up to date, to identify emerging issues and respond to them. So product stewardship is pretty broad. It, it's got multiple benefits and one of the things I'm always keen to push is the business benefits and I know John's going to be talking a little bit about that later. The benefits to companies in terms of reputation, compliance, loyalty, business opportunities and so on. For local government, clearly there's opportunities to share the cost of, of dealing with some of these products to reduce waste to landfill, provide better services to residents and to obviously meet their own sustainability goals. Um, Obviously, the benefits vary depending on the product, but we need to keep them in mind. I wanted to mention one design case study because we do forget about that end sometimes and the fact that these 
there is a, a, an important role for councils to play in talking to companies about recyclability. Foodstuffs is a New Zealand retailer. Some of you may know them. Um, they, they won an award, a negative award, when they got named and shamed for all their packaging, um, particularly the meat trays and the fresh produce trays. Uh, Mike Sammons, who's pictured there holding the new trays, went and talked to Auckland City Council and said, um, you know, how could we design our tray so that it will fit with the recycling system? Because they were getting pinged for lack of recycling uh, of their foamed polystyrene trays. Um, and the council came back and said, this is great. We never get companies coming to us and talking to us about how they should design their packaging. Um, the conclusion they came to was that it was PET or recycled PET. They went to the market um, and they've come up with a, a dimpled uh, tray that is 100% um, PET. It's got 50% recycled PET and they've got rid of the soaker pad. And it's a really nice solution. It can now be added to, to curbside. But the reason I've got this one in there, because it is an, an unusual um, collaboration and we should see, see more of it. There is a growing number of product stewardship schemes and these are the sort of people that um, we've been talking to over the last few weeks about greater collaboration. Um, and they often involve um, the manufacturers and the retailers, but some of them uh, go broader. And I'll just mention a couple, partly because it's about the value of collaboration and it's partly about understanding the business case for, for different schemes. Cartridge recycling, Peter Tamlin spoke before. Um, and I've got to stop talking about this. People are going to think I'm on the payroll, I suppose. But um, I do like the fact that this is a voluntary scheme and that it is meeting a, a number of um, needs, obviously, for the consumer to have an end, um, a recycling outlet for their products. Um, but for the, bi the businesses that are involved in this, they get added value because they get a lot of business intelligence back from the recycler, close the loop. It's a really interesting collaboration both between the original equipment manufacturers who pay for the recycling of their products, um, Planet Arc, who's obviously in part, part of the marketing and communication of the scheme, the retailers who provide the drop-off customers or consumers who have to bring them back, um, yeah, and the recycler. Red Cycle is another one I like because it's a small program but it's got a lot of funding through the, um, the brands, the manufacturers of, of products in soft plastics. It's not the most efficient solution because consumers have to bring plastics back to the retail stores, uh, but it is at least providing an outlet and it is getting a lot of companies involved in soft plastics recycling that haven't been involved before. Um, once again, it involves um, the consumers um, taking responsibility for bringing materials back. Replast take that material, local government, and other organisations are buying back the plastics. There's other initiatives looking at um, soft plastics, like the Plastic Police Project that Samantha's involved in, if you want to know about that. We've got some really interesting initiatives happening, and, and stewardship's critical to making this happen. I'm not going to talk about batteries, because Libby's going to tell us all about batteries. This one's a work in progress, and I've been involved for quite a long time trying to get this scheme up. But what I would note is that there's a lot of things happening, bubbling up from the ground, a lot of um, interesting initiatives happening, and, and hopefully we will end up with a more coherent program and Libby will fill us in. But really, we're scratching the surface. Any of us could take these photos on any day of the week. What's going to happen to these products that don't have a recycling outlet, that are thrown away in huge volumes every, every day? And stewardship has got to be part of that solution because it potentially involves design and it involves the development of end-of-life solutions. So some key messages, product stewardship. It is a new model for, for, um, for waste management. It does have multiple benefits if it's designed well and strategically. Collaboration is the bleedingly obvious and we need to both promote that within industry and between industry and other stakeholders. And I'd encourage any of you to, to, to find out more about what's going on and how you can work with some of these existing and, and emerging PSOs. And like I, I mentioned, we are working on this ongoing network, which will do a lot of, um, hopefully, uh, be able to contribute a lot to the knowledge sharing and networking within the sector. Thank you. Thank you.